Hello, 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 and welcome to It's All Good. I'm your host, Latavia, and in this week's episode, we will be continuing the conversation started in Where Do We Go From Here uh, with my friend Matthew King. So if you haven't listened to the first part, I would say stop now, go back and listen because you'll miss a lot of the context and the, the nuggets that were shared in the first part. Um, so once you've listened, then come back and listen to this episode. Um, so before we get into the episode for today, I just want to take some time to say thank you to all of you for listening. Um, that is my gratitude moment for this week. I am grateful for all of you who are li- who have listened and continue to do so. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, like, comment, all that good stuff. If you're not following the podcast, please do so. It's podcast at It's All Good. And leave me some comments. Let me know your thoughts. If there are topics that you'd like to hear covered on the show, let me know. But without any further delay, let's get into the episode for this week. John Kerry and George Bush were fraternity brothers. Only certain people can kind of understand how deep that goes. But John Kerry and, and George Bush were fraternity brothers. They played this at a different level. They play this game at a different level. We don't even know how deep this goes. So to simplify our understanding of it, we need to come up with a 10-point plan that is conducive for our entire community and go to them and say, hey, Mr. Democrat, this is our 10-point plan. Would you mind supporting this this election? Matter of fact, just think about it. Go to the Republican. Hey, Mr. Republican, Ms. Republican, this is our 10-point plan. You mind supporting it? Matter of fact, don't answer that. Think about it. And then we just going to sit by the phone. Whoever called first. Right. Who and ever, else? I'm sorry. Go ahead. No. Well, I was just saying, like, whoever calls first, and you know, because you know what OG Bob Johnson was talking about, we make that 13 percent up of that voter block. Let you know, and I'm I'm a she know she knows that I'm a Malcolm Ballard of the Bullet type brother, you know, straight out. But let's just for the sake of conversation, saying that we're playing this game, we're 13 percent of the voter block which means that we could swing every election that comes through this door if we were locked still. Every last one of them. Republicans, if we did not show up to the polls or we shifted that, they would win every last one of the elections. If we came out in numbers like we did uh, for Obama, we could put a black man in office. That's power. That's power. But where we have to go is we can't get caught up in upward mobility. That's too much with, you know, being satisfied with just a few of us being let in the house. And that's what happens. Well, so up. Yeah, no, but that's the part, like you said, and you touched on it when you were talking about the Montgomery bus boycotts and that we, I think it, they did a movie Eye on the Prize. Like, I think initially the prize was we want to have social and economic equality or equity. But somewhere along that process or that journey, the social part became bigger. And that was, that became the focal point. And like you said, the economic part of it, we lost. And to me, that's the part that, you know, people always talk about the whole Malcolm versus Martin thing. They were a lot closer aligned than people want to acknowledge. And specifically late, like towards the end of his life, um, Martin was definitely, to me, that's, that's why he was killed is because he's, he's, he was like, hold up. It was almost like, and I'm not just going to give him all the credit. I'm sure collectively there was within the leadership. It was like, hold up. We're kind of, we're, we've taken our eye off the prize or we're shifting We're we're losing sight of it. And we need to, bring hold on, let's talk about, let's talk about, Martin for a second. Huh? let's talk about, Martin, no, 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 let's talk about Martin for a second. Cause that's a good point. I would encourage everyone to go back and listen to the entirety of the I Have a Dream speech. Not just the part that they play on his birthday, not just the part that they play in February. Listen to the entirety of the speech. The entirety of the speech is a respiration, is a, sorry, talking too fast. Reparations cry from Mark. He says that- The dream part was just an, was almost an afterthought. It Not was. It was. Thought, but that wasn't the, the dream part. Wasn't the focus. But that was the. This, the, the, that, the that was fuzzy part that they put, put that, out. That was 
white folks hijacking Martin's legacy, making him seem like he was more docile than what he actually was, and then ultimately giving that to us as a pacifier anytime we get out of control. The one thing I want to tell about white, why I want to tell white folks is stop bringing up Martin in these situations. Y'all killed him too. So it, <laughs> it, it ain't, that ain't nothing. You, to, you, you didn't like him when he was alive. You were yeah, yeah. the so, same wiretaps and all these other things that they were doing to Malcolm, they were doing to him as well as the others within the movement. Um, but like I said, that's the part I, you said, but, you know, read or listen to the entire, I have a dream speech. The same goes for the letter from, uh, was the letter from the Birmingham mm -hmm. jail. Um, the last speech that he gave, which when it, when it shifted to, you know, he was talking about workers' rights and the, the poor people's campaign, things of that nature, like. Which is why they really took him out. Yeah, because he, it was like, oh, wait a minute. He has the ear of the people. They're already following him. And we're cool if y'all want to keep coming out here and doing your civil disobedience and getting in good trouble, as John Lewis calls it. Um, and y'all can keep doing these protests because that's fine. Because we're, we're still getting to hurt you. That's fine. But hold up. You're now talking to them. And, and they saw, hold up, what Malcolm is saying and what Martin are saying are starting to line up in the public, not just behind closed doors. And it's, oh, wait a minute. If he starts telling them about this, like to demand equality, economic equality, oh, they're going to realize that. And then they're going to galvanize around that. And then we're really going to have a problem. Oh, so you know what? Let's nip that in the bud. We'll take him out. And then because... I love the emotion that we have and that we are such a forgiving people. But that that literally, like, that was like a cut the legs out from under us because at that point, Mal Malcolm X had already been killed. Wait. He was already dead. Yeah. So Malcolm X had already been killed. There were others who had been killed that, you know, don't get as, they don't get talked about as much. But, and then you had Malcolm, and then they killed Martin. And it's just like, everyone understandably was, like, the wind knocked out of them. And it just, okay, hold up. We're going to try to get a few things done in the wake of it. But to the, me, it was just, they, it was a, the similar effect of what happened after they bombed Tulsa. Um, and even, this is something else we talked about, I just, before I forget, even when we had communities that were thriving, Black communities that were thriving, and I'm thinking about Durham, and as much as I enjoy the convenience of the Durham Freeway, like they ran that highway literally right through the black community and they separated it and they did that across the country. Like that is a part of the blueprint or the, the game the playbook or whatever of, oh, y'all are starting to do some things. Okay, well, we're going to give you this, but oh, we'll do it at this cost. And to your point, um, the reason why they had to get rid of Martin at that time was the climate. We talk about timing and climate. Um, the climate in which Martin was planning that poor people's campaign, the, you got to remember, these, this is 1968. So uh, JFK's already died. Malcolm X has already died. Megan Evers has already died. There's a few, there's a few people that, that's already died. So the nonviolent movement had been going on for a few years now. Now there had been a new generation, the Stokely Carmichael's, the SNICs, yeah. the, you know, all of these figures were younger than Martin and they were looking at, Martin was looking at white people saying, hey, look, I can't tell them what to be nonviolent for so long. Y'all gonna have to do something. Y'all gonna have to cut a check. So what they got really scared of was the, to your point, they knew if, and I mean, the, 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 the writer of uh, uh, X Men was so genius when he when he pegged uh, the concept of Magneto and uh, Professor X off of Martin Luther King and Malcolm X. But to pin those two brothers <clears throat> together, people don't know that Coretta was actually passing messages to uh, Malcolm while Martin was in jail. Like they had plans. You know, the reason why they know that the Nation of Islam didn't kill Malcolm X is because when Malcolm X was over. And doing his uh, pilgrims to Mecca, he was go he was about to go over to France, and France wouldn't let his let his plane land over there because they said they don't want you to be assassinated on French soil. So he said, "Oh, I knew this is something bigger than the nation of Islam. This ain't the nation of Islam that's over here following me. Where I'm getting the backings of 33 nations to take 
our case to the UN. And if Martin and Malcolm could have made it to the UN, but to your point, where we are now and what we should learn from our mistakes is we should not have leader-led movements anymore. Anytime a leader-led movement happens or we thrust or anoint or, you know, thrown a leader, as soon as that leader is cut, then the whole movement is for naught. So what I would love for us to get away from is if you have a favorite entertainer, a favorite athlete, let that person be your favorite entertainer and your favorite athlete. Stop there are people in the, be the spokesperson. That, listen. <laughs> we the only clown people that and we were talking about this yesterday when um, when Europeans when Americans want to talk about like black people whether you whether we want to acknowledge it or not we're, we've been at war we've been at war we've been prisoners of war for the last 450 years whether we want to acknowledge it or not that's on you but when white people decide that they're going to go to war you know the people that are coming to speak on the behalf of their collective on how they gonna move is the joint chief of staff. <laughs> you know, they're gonna have qualified people speaking on it. They not calling Faith Hill, they not calling Kenny Chestnut, they not calling Tom Brady, they okay. not calling they not calling Jerry Seinfeld, they not calling, you know, David Letterman, they calling none of these figures to ask them how they feel about topics that they aren't qualified to speak on. And it's not that I don't feel like these celebrities cannot add to the conversation historically speaking they've always been a vital part if, when galvanizing our community but we have to be a lot more mature in who we allow to say that they're talking for us so one is we need to tell celebrities that they don't talk to the community and i love killing i love j cole i love k dot i'm naming people that i actually subscribe to not even people that i'm being funny to but even the incident with j cole this past week it's like Cole is coming out like, yo, bro, I'm a rapper who is conscious enough to understand my surroundings, but I'm not saying that I'm qualified to be the leader of Black folks. Exactly. Like, I, I'm just not saying that I am. And for us to put that pressure on anybody, you know, my sister says all the time, I can't believe I'm quoting my sister like she is some wise <laughs> ass. Anyway. She um, is. Give her but, her credit. I mean, you know, comedians have a strange sense of humor. They, they always look at life you know, very strangely, but she says, you know, I don't go to my pastor to pull my teeth. I don't go to my teacher to do my taxes. I'm not expecting my entertainers to do my social activism because exactly. they didn't go, to, they didn't go to school for this. They weren't qualified for this. And then taking a step back, now we need to re-examine who is our advocacy group and are they doing an effective program? So what is the Urban League doing? What is the NAACP doing? What is the Black Caucus doing? What are any of these groups that are supposed to be speaking for us are do we have qualified leaderships in those positions because those are the actual positions that are directly affecting our everyday lives no, no offense it ain't what lebron is thinking it ain't what you know what i mean that dave Chappelle always says like who who cares what jake ja Rule thinks at a time like this like that is just such a genius who right. cares so like, that been, and if you have not watched uh his latest special i strongly encourage you to do that um because he he dropped so many gems from a historical perspective, but he also is just, it makes sense. And it's funny. It's, it's not a funny thing, but there are like funny moments, but, but yeah, it's, and even you mentioned like thinking back, um, it's crazy. I was, as you were talking, I'm thinking like, hold on, we're supposed to be talking about where we go, but we're, we're talking about things in the past, but it's like, you can't really, you it's can't impossible. plan for the future if you don't understand your history. And I think that is a big thing in terms of like, where do we go? Or, you know, a lot of the whole conversation is what can I do? What can you do? Educate yourself. And I recognize that, like educate yourself. And this is part, I, I think this is the beauty of this conversation is there's a lot of things that have been touched on from a historical perspective. And, you know, you know what? I, I wouldn't expect anybody to try to become an expert or know everything all at once. Like, just take the time, read. Like, there's different things. And now we have audio books. There's videos. Like, you can, there are- YouTube. Some, like, YouTube is YouTube, your like, friend. If you, don't, if you don't like to read or you're not a reader, you can listen. You can watch. You can, there are some credible people out there that you can listen and get information from so that you have a understanding for yourself, not just what you have heard on news on the news where it's a very watered down version. It's not what you see on social media um, or wherever it's 
I think a big part of it is we have, and this is something I think that not just black people, but we've got to get back to getting education or getting, forming our own opinions, not basing what I think about something based on what I read or what I saw or what this person said or did. And even to the point of looking to celebrities to be the spokespeople, if you think back to, I don't know as much, even going back into like the Harlem Renaissance era, like the entertainers were the, they were the soundtrack. Um, like Langston Hughes, uh, Nina Simone, uh, I, I can't think of anything, but those are two that just come to mind. Like we know about Nina, she was involved and she used her platform and she spoke and she sang and she, she, she wrote songs. Um, and then you go to the civil rights movement, like, Marvin, Marvin put about, the whole hmm? what's going on. Marvin, they, Marvin put out a whole they, conscious album. They were there. They were a part of it. They helped fund it. Like That's... Aretha Franklin, a lot of people didn't know like how much she funded the the different things. And even in and I want to say shout out to Girl Trek because I'm doing this 21 um, day uh, Black History Boot Camp where they're focusing highlighting different women throughout history, Black women throughout history. And of course, now the name escapes me, but there's a woman who she was basically, she fed the movement. She, when the, specifically with the Montgomery bus boycott, like when it started, um, she had gotten fired from her job. So basically they gave her some money to say, start your own business. And she cooked dinners. And then she taught other women how to do it. And basically that was their way of, they sold dinners and meals to everyone around the, the city the area and then they took that money and then funded it to buy gas to get the cars repaired to do all the things so it's like there were people who i think the thing that keeps coming to mind is find your lane and stay in it find your role find your place and then do it um you know they even talk about that is even talked about in the bible like we're all a part of one body but if it, the the pinky can't do what the thumb can do like so if you're going to be a pinky be the best pinky you can be but do something and even if that is like I said like first and foremost is educating yourself so you can understand where we've been so we don't continue to keep repeating the the um the same steps so we can get out of this I guess I'm calling it the cycle of despair, but um, it is a cycle of despair. And I, I hope that the first thing that they decide to do is we have to stop looking at ourselves personally and collectively through the lens of Europeans. It's yes. vital to our survival. Yes. It's vital it was, to the survival. It was a letter or a book, but of like how to make a slave and the whole thing. of So whoever, yeah. the, the, when they created that in terms of the divisions and the divisiveness, they planted the seeds that were planted about Eurocentric beauty. Talk about the skin. Willie Lynch letter? Even before the Willie Lynch letter. It may have been in the Willie Lynch letter. No, I think it was in the Willie Lynch letter. They referenced some person that was like before then about how to, like how they even created the different, you know, the whole, the house slave versus the field one. And colorism which that's a whole other sub that's a whole other ism but it's they did a great job in brainwashing us and, and ingraining that and not just american black people but everywhere that's been colonized because that's something that's you know a global Thank issue you. but i think with that we've got to get out of the mindset like you said we've got to stop looking at ourselves through that lens um because that's a big part of like you said we got the social equality to an extent but we sacrificed the economic equality. Like you said, we had, there were successful bus, black owned bus companies, the Negro leagues, um, education. Uh, so one thing I, I request <laughs> when we get these reparation check, cause I'm gonna just keep saying when, um, for our historically black colleges and universities, there's been a lot of talk about, oh, if you wanna support the community, send your kids to HBCUs, you know, provide funds to HBCUs. A large majority, uh, majority of our HBCUs now that are in the South are public institutions and they are, they heavily rely on um, federal and state funding and because they have habitually received the short end of the stick and not received adequate funding, they are behind in various areas. One of my thought or, or hopefully we can do it is when we get these reparations that we will fund them and we will create these endowments so that they can know they don't know they no longer have to be the public universe. They don't have to be reliant on 
public funding, the state and federal funding to do everything that even if they remain public universities in the sense that they're more affordable, they're not so reliant on the funding that they get from the federal and state governments that we can become more, they can become more independent. And then also the, the ones that are already independent, um, we can revitalize them. Um, and so that we're not having to do campaigns to try to save them every few years. You're absolutely right. So. And I, I think that it is um, absolutely vital because we, when you talk about we got social equality, mm, what we got was, for it. well, what we got was desegregation. What they promised was integration. What we never got was integration. What we got was desegregation. So what ended up happening was we had to sacrifice everything that made us a community in order to assimilate to their community. And again, that's where the social mobility comes into. You know, if I can make now, it becomes a, instead of enhancing my neighborhood, now I got to make it out the hood. Now that's the whole change of concept. And we talked about the geographical locations of most of these HBCUs. They're located directly within the hood. So, you know, we have to be able to get back to um, re-evaluating our institutions and holding the leadership accountable because, um, yes, there's a lot of mismanagement with these HBCUs and corruption and that needs to go, but these institutions are also operating on a hand-to-mouth budget. And when you're operating on a hand-to-mouth budget, you're constantly having to sacrifice something for something. Yeah. And what we're saying is that shouldn't be the case anymore. Um, to speak along the lines of just what practical implications are so we don't leave this as a pipe dream. Um, I subscribe to the American Indian model and as we were speaking to because that's the group that we can directly have a direct lineage between their sacrifice, our sacrifice, what they got as reparations and what we're owed as reparations. So with the American Indians, Aboriginal Indians, who some of us, majority of us actually are, but that's neither here nor there. Um, what they were able to get was they sacrificed the land for this country to be built. So that was what they were justified to get their reservations. We sacrificed our labor. That's what we're justified to get our reparations. There's federal lands that were giving to the Indian people after America pushed them all over the country and killed the majority of them. <clears throat> they said, you can settle right here. And the Indians amongst themselves said, okay, now we're a nation. We're the Indian nation, we're the Blackfoot nation, we're the Lumbee nation. They made themselves a nation. They created their own constitution. Then they went back to the uh, governments and said, hey, look, here's our constitution. This is what we want. Give us our reparations. Now, you know, the alcohol and the casinos and what they doing with it, now, you know what I'm saying? Like, what I'm telling, you know, the only conversation I want to have with white people is cut a check and clear your conscience. That's all we want. Cut this check and leave us alone. Let us figure it out. Roll us off of all of your social programs. Get us off of your welfare, your your um, your uh, public housing, your EPT. You don't have to account for us no more on your books. What should happen is we should have enough access to capital by that point in order to ignite our self-determination as a community. At that point, it, there should be no more excuses. And, you know, I was telling you this, and sometimes I, I guess sometimes I'm too militant for my own good, but I recognize there are going to be casualties of war where everybody's not going to agree with what, with what is going on. And we're such a traumatized people that I know that some people would rather jump off the boat than to try to, you know, survive the waves. And that's fine. I'm not begging everybody to have our perspective. What I'm what I am striving for is, though, is to connect with like-minded people in order to maintain something for ourselves. So not every Chinese person lives in Chinatown. Not even every Jewish person lives in the Jewish district. So that's not what it is. But when we're talking about out here and, and within this climate, what are we going to leave tangibly with in order to improve tomorrow? We have to come with what they call a business, a business with a direct ask. It can't be ambiguous it can't be disney-fied it can't be no offense police reform is disney-fied you want police reform build your own subdivisions hire your own private security contractors and only call the police officers when it's an actual one there you go there's your police reform to that point Lord, i lost my thought that fast but no like 
to that point you said the, the things that are just have direct ask i think like you said I, I would love to see police reform i'd love to see you know hey look at me like the shirt i have on right now it says look at me i'm human too like see my humanity i want that we need that but i recognize that at this point well not at this point but that's not we can change the laws the laws have been changed we can legislate things we can put things in place to make it illegal it's already illegal to discriminate but it still happens <laughs> that's what i'm saying um, it still happens it's <laughs> you're not supposed to profile people you're not supposed to do things yes we can pass more laws and i think speaking of laws one of the things specific to police reform i think that would go a long way is uh i went to law, i was in school for a total of seven years undergrad in law school plus the bar exam and I have to continuously educate myself just so that I can practice law. Police become police in six months. They go to the academy for six months. They get a, maybe a month or two of education. And I've had this conversation with some police officers and then all of a sudden you're qualified to enforce the law. So one thing we can do is how about we extend the time they need to be, you go do your maybe a six months of whatever your basic training is to get the physical part of it. But no, I need you to be in school for a year or two under to learn the law and or whatever. I think they need to be in training longer. So that's one piece. But the overall thing, what I'm saying is all of those things, they're great. And they, in terms of an emotional standpoint, the feeling, the social or the moral high ground, all that stuff, that's great. But a law is not going to change somebody's heart. Like that's for God to do. And I'm praying and believing that that's, that's like, that's something where even the Bible says, you know, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. It's a spiritual battle. So as much as I can talk to I'm blue in the face to someone trying to explain to them, I'm a human, see my humanity, understand my experience. But that's not going to change it if God doesn't change their heart. So that's between them and God. So for now, I'm going to leave that part with God. <laughs> And I need us to say, you know what, no, we need this. Cut the check. Um, like you said, give us these. Um, these are our ask. And when we from comes to politics and when we're voting, what are our, what was it, the PIP, like the, the interest? What is our interest? Um, what is our permanent interest? The permanent yeah, interest. And, and we need to shift the focus to that. And okay. let's, 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 let's pin on police brutality real quick because um, I, I don't want to dwell on it because it's draining but let me just touch on it real fast uh greensboro has the third oldest police department in the country and i believe i i don't want to misspeak but i'm gonna throw it out of somewhere around like 1803 something like that the concept of policing is no older than 250 years old it is not this is not so, like they will want to beat the concept of policing in our head as if the world has never operated without stormtroopers but in all actuality, we have had various forms of police, community policing amongst ourselves that we've allowed. But the issue that I have with coming to them and asking them for police reform is, like I, I was mentioning yesterday, the only police reform that I want to know is when, when can we make it a law to where once a police officer is doing something illegal he's no longer protected as a police officer now i can shoot that's the only type of reform that i want because if i can't get that reform then i can't defend myself and i think that when we look at you know the the different like i said you couldn't do that they couldn't do this to middle easterns well they couldn't they could no you're right and that's i was listening to i want to say it was the levels pod they talked about that in the just in the sense of we've got to, it goes back to we've got to hold each other accountable. Um, we are quick to, and and I guess I'm, I'm hesitant because, you know, some conversations I think we need to have in private, but I just think it goes down to accountability. We've got to hold each other accountable. And I, like you said, it wouldn't happen in certain communities because they would come out and they, they would, would strap a bomb on themselves, themselves and walk themselves into the precinct. And listen, they will be waiting for their versions. You hear me? <laughs> they will say, that, that's waiting for their versions. Um, but I, am, I, 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 I don't. But that, but I, to, to we, stay. We need to be accountable to each other. In order for us, this is this is my message to the black men, specifically. Specifically. In order for us to restore our community, we have to become protectors. 
and, so and again for the ones in the back. In order for us to restore our communities, we have to become protectors again. And in the words of Brother Malcolm, that is by any means necessary. So it, you know, I, I am all with our sisters going to be diplomatic and asking them to, hey, look at my humanity and I can't breathe and all everything else that our sisters are so great at articulating and being able to express for us. But what I need the other side of the table to understand that there's going to be a strong power behind our sisters to protect them. And if negotiations break down, then we're we're not we're no longer going to allow our sisters to be vulnerable. We're no longer going to allow our kids to be vulnerable. We're no longer going to allow our brothers to be vulnerable. But in order to have that mature conversation across the table, again, not to have not to have everything you know out in the open right now, but you know at some point in time, our people we have to stop romanticizing about our own self-destruction. So I say that as if like we can't say that black lives matter but then turn around and rap about killing our brother and trust me i love the lyrics i love jeezy i love wayne i love you know what i'm saying like bro i'm i'm a hip-hop head so don't take it like that but when you talk about the fact that we are in war there's a time and a place for everything so when there's a time for us to have fun and to joke around and roast they was me and my sister was laughing the other day because we figured out like roasting like roasting people black people been doing that since slavery Mm -hmm. That stems all the way from slavery. We're trying to figure out when did they have time <laughs> between <laughs> those. They were probably <laughs> in the midst of it to keep the past the time. We, listen, regardless of what's going on, what's going to happen is black people going to have the time. We don't care we'll what is going time, on. We're we going to find a way to laugh about it. We're going to find you know, Listen. Like, because even this, during this pandemic, you know, like I've heard, them, like, we're going to get these jokes off. Like, it's. Facts. We'll find a way. So that I have that of that I have no doubt. But we'll we need to take right, a but but we got to take a step back, and we have to be a lot more militant in our thought. And the 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 progress that was made from the civil rights era was because a lot of those brothers believed in what they said. They stood on what they said, and that's that shows based off of the ultimate sacrifice that they were willing to get. You know, brothers took bullets for what they believed in, and we can be such a passive generation when it comes to our oppressive, but yet such an overly aggressive generation when it comes to our brothers. That is, you know, we have to recognize when we're being played. And, you know, when you talk about, you know, how we lost it after Malcolm and, and, and Martin, it's because that there was such a militant generation coming up behind them with, the brothers in SNCC and the brothers in the Black Panther Party and the brothers, Robert Williams and these brothers in North Carolina, like we, it was so many militant brothers that coming in that they knew that they had to come in and infiltrate it at that point. It was like, these brothers, then the energy is here. So we have to, we have to shift the energy from us to them. And to think that if I'm at war with another country and I know that they're bigger, stronger, faster, sing better, jump higher, dance longer, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's all these different attributes that we can we can bring to them. If I can, you know, they talk about uh, three-dimensional war or four-dimensional war, being able to win a fight or win a war without shooting a bullet. And that's what they're doing to us right now. We are at a war and we don't hear gunshots. We're in a war and we don't hear bombs. And it's literally because they have strategically cherry-picked us systematically from each particular angle. And then they cap us off, you know, you could say 10%, but I don't even think it's 10%, it's probably like 3 or 4%. 3 or 4% of us out of the whole population, they allow us to get a little sweet taste of the pot. That way they can say, hey, look, it's, it's, we are constantly in the Hunger Games. We are constantly the lottery ticket. Somebody in our community is going to be the lottery ticket. And what they tell the rest of us is, just keep playing the lottery. <laughs> right. Such as such was able to do it. Because such and such, they such and such won the lottery. Why can't you win the lottery? Person. And it's like, they won the lottery. Why can't you win the lottery? And why is it our community that is playing the lottery with our lives? That's what I want to get away from. So in regards to being able to ask, the, the, the only police reform I see is us policing ourselves. That's point blank period. I don't see no other police reform happening because you cannot change the, if, the, if the bloodline of the police is slave patrol, there is no change in that. There is no change in that. 
a breed of a pit bull is a breed of a pit bull. I don't care how much you try to treat him like a poop. <laughs> I just don't care. <laughs> it just, I just don't care. And to jump into a pit of snakes and try to figure out which snake is gonna bite you and which snake ain't gonna bite you no, is a waste of time. No thanks. That, that is a, that is a waste of time. Okay. So that's what we're doing right now. We're jumping in pits of snakes, trying to figure out which snake ain't gonna bite us. And it, I feel like our energy would be more well served and we would could endure the stand of taking long lasting change if we one took our economics more seriously and two we we, we restored our own institutions we examining our, our churches and their interactions in our community our universities and their interactions in our community. Making sure that we have pillars like black hospitals again, make sure that we have pillars like um, black social services again, um, like doula services, midwife services, like, you know, getting back to being able to operate amongst ourselves, being able to get back to our vocational training. So mixing uh, Booker T, W.E.D.B. and uh, uh, Marcus Garvey all in the same time. We can be intellectual, we can be vocational, and we can be self-determined. They, all of those things can be simultaneous amongst each other because we're such a diverse people. The black folks in Seattle ain't like the black folks in Memphis who ain't like the black folks in Kalamazoo who ain't like the black folks in DC. We are such diverse that let our differences be our commonality. And because we have so many differences, there should be five to 10 very, very common things that we can all agree upon to say, hey, look, this will benefit all of us. And if we take this money and we create these, I mean, to be honest with you, again, with the Indian, um, the Indian model, they got land and they're still getting reparations. Let's reestablish the Freeman's Bill. The government, we are, that's the important thing about history. To, for us to be like, how can we do this? The government was already about to do it. <laughs> they already was about to do this. Like, it was already in play. A lot of people did get 40 acres in the middle. That's what, yeah. you know, yeah, I want to clear too. They did do that, yeah. The Freeman's Bureau was in operation for a good two, three years. So it was not as if like this was not already in play. Andrew jo Johnson put a stop to it. Let's read. If we wanna if we wanna amend things, stop the commercials, stop the Instagram posts. I don't I don't care about Blackout Tuesdays. I don't care about the Kente Claus. I don't care about what Trump said. <laughs> like we have to take all of these emotional trigger events that they give us because that's really all it all it does. Cool. It triggers our <laughs> I, I agree, but I, I wouldn't say just because the same is with the bus boy, the boycotts and other other movements. It's not just a one thing. I think I don't think we necessarily now the Kente cloth thing. Yes, please stop like that. That mm -mm, let's not do it ever again. Um, but some of these things, I think for some people, I would say that that is some people's land. And what is it? It's like you might plant a seed, but somebody else is going to make it grow or water it to grow. So I don't think we necessarily need to stop those things, but I do, I do think it needs to be those things plus. Like that can't be the only thing anymore. Like we need to do that as a part of a larger plan, but that doesn't need to be the sole focus anymore. But I don't want to see that from corporations. Well, there's no, individuals. Corporations. Yeah, I mean, there's in it. Yeah, absolutely. No, no. First of all, let me clarify my statement. Whatever black people's reaction to this in regards to how they express their emotions is validated and go do it. What I'm more so speaking directly towards is what are we tangibly asking for in return? So what we're getting is in return are symbolic apologies. What symbolic apologies do is nothing to change our quality of life. So what I'm asking directly for is all of these institutions that are implementing these apologies or giving money to these uh, anonymous programs, let's re-avert all of these resources directly to the communities. That way we ain't got to have this conversation. We, this doesn't have to be a long drawn out thing. You know, tell, if you're a corporation and you feel sorry about it, you donate $50 million to this community. If you're that sorry, I'm, there's ways to fix this. So, you know, to, I don't, what I, what I, what I don't want black people to be able to do is because they know we're such a forgiving people, Bob Johnson talked about this, we're such a forgiving people and we're such a, a loving people. And, you know, they don't understand that about us, that we don't have that greed. Yet. It just isn't in us. We don't have the idea of having a, like, what they, what white people are scared of is, there's, and we talked about this too, and a lot of people have been, you know, referring back to this too, they're scared of revenge. They think that black, when, when, they, when, we, when they hear equality, when we say equality, what they hear is revenge. 
Yeah. Trust me, if we wanted revenge, it would have been happening. It would have been happening. We would have we would have went Haiti eighteen oh four, what jumped off the boat. It would have what but because we are children of the sun and, 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 and children of the most high, that's not how we that's not God, how God designed us. So like God hasn't put in our heart revenge that is bloodthirsty. What he's put in our heart is a desire to be greater than what we are right now. And but in order for us to, to become that, we have to stand firm on what tools it would take in order for us to like get to that point. And it's it's really important. It's it's really vital that as a community we get locked step on, you know, politically speaking, being able to separate what the media tells us to think, as you said and being able to uh, get back to our formed opinion. So I love black media, you are black media, and you know what I'm saying, we gotta support black media and keep black media up because we're the ones that are, um, we're the only ones that are going to officially uh, inform what we have going on. And I would definitely, you know, especially y'all got Zoom, man, you link up with a few more people and, you know, spread the platform because this is, you know, these are powerful conversations that, you know, no offense to my fraternity brother they ain't gonna be talking about this even on roland martin's show you know what i'm saying like and this is what i mean by like i mean I'm, I, he, but I'm, he i i have to i don't agree with everything that he says or how he does it but i i do want to give him credit because there are he does bring light to some things that uh, they're, they're not covered on mainstream media i mean if you the token one what else are you gonna talk about well that's why i said it's it i do think some of it has become a bit sensationalized in well, terms of how he covers it, but and, I do appreciate that it's there. Um, and, and I said, that's I, a, by no means do I agree with everything. That well, what I pre- I appreciate the media of, and let me take it. Let me not. I'm a little bit hard. That's maternity brother. So yeah, I could be a little bit more critical okay. of our own. But I the the danger in playing a political game for our community outside of what brother OG Bob uh, Bob Johnson and other OGs have been saying for a long time, I have grown to know is just two forms of slavery, two different forms of slavery. If anybody pushes us too far to the right, or if anybody pushes us too far to the left, I have understood that that to be only two forms of slavery. The reason why I can't be a full-time Republican is because I can't be that shut mouth Negro that just stands lockstep. Although my ideologies, my principles, and my economics more so line up with conservative values, that doesn't mean that I'm a Trump supporter. Right, but I mean, we're gonna be real. A lot of black people, if they're honest with themselves, they line up more with things that are Republican. Um, but the only reason, the only reason we we in, we want we line up with the Democrats because we ain't got no resources. <laughs> We need those grants. We need those food stamps. We need that public housing. Like we, but like, the, I mean, and that's another thing in terms of the whole Republican versus Democrat. Because it's like in the eighteen hundreds, black people were Republican because Lincoln was Republican, and that was who freed us. But even the, there are so many different. Um, <laughs> because they're fluent. Because white people go to their interests. Yes. That's the thing about white people. White people vote to their interests. So when when they came out and Democrats initially came out, because Democrats was the ones that <laughs> was fighting for the South. Let me reiterate that point. With the, the the Confederate flag is a Democratic, yeah, the, the the Confederate flag is a Democratic flag. But the fluidity of white people is when they initially came out. Uh, JFK was the one who started, uh, you know, really FDR too. But JFK became the one that really started reaching across the aisle to black folks and to underprivileged folks and started to bring them back over and started to have these conversations. And all those traditional Democrats was like, oh, 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 that's where you get all these Dixiecrats from, like these strong Thurmans and all these people coming in like, oh, I don't, we not all that. But when Lyndon B. Johnson came in and he started, you know, really signing things into order, like that was a power grab. And what ended up happening is when Richard Nixon and all them came in, you had a massive switch, a massive switch of white people. You know, we and black people, we don't look at it like that, but white people switch from one party to another literally because their private interests changed. Yep. So conservative conservative white people say, you know what, Democrats, y'all want to pander to black people and do all this civil rights stuff? I'm going Republican. And all the Republicans, they said, hey, look, 
I ain't with all of this, you know what I'm saying, oppression that y'all with. We trying to make this a better union and y'all ain't with it. So let me go over here and go Democrat. For us, we should have stayed out of it. My dad used to tell me this and it was you know, some of the best advice he used to always get me. He said, some white folks are going to shut up. <laughs> and I mean, I, I, you know, it is the honest to God truth. And I feel like, you know, as a community, we, you know, when we see, you know, I'm, that's not even work. That's not even, that's a prime I mean, Like I said, there, but, there's so many things and so many different, like there's so much, um, but I, I appreciate this conversation um, because, you know, we could, we could keep going on so many different things. Tell me about it. I think, yeah. I know, I, and I think we're going on like a, a good two hours now. So. Yeah, we're close to it. Um, but, yeah. and so, <laughs> because of that, I mean, you know, we probably need to wrap this up. But um, like I said, I, I, I genuinely appreciate you and the conversation. And those of you listening, I encourage you to take some time and educate yourself. We, we, we touched on a lot of different people, a lot of different things, eras. So you don't have to try to do it all at once. Um, for those that don't necessarily like reading, like I said, we talked about the Bob Johnson interview. Um, Dr. Claude Anderson has a lot of books, but he's also done several interviews that you can go on YouTube where he's talked about it. Um, the different conversations about how the Emancipation Proclamation came about, you can read and listen about that. The fact that Lincoln didn't really want to free the slaves. It was just, it was convenient. It was strategic. It was um, a war group. Right. Um, Prohibition, the Civil Rights Movement. Um, like I said, I mentioned Girl Track and the 21 Day um, Black History Boot Camp, where they have been highlighting various um, Black women in history. There's NPR, uh, PBS. <laughs> like I said, there's books. There's a lot of different resources out there, but just take some time to read or to listen um, so that you can un have a better understanding of where we've been so you can figure out the answer to the question of where do we go from here for yourself? Like, yes, collectively, if nothing else, we, I think we are in agreement that the government needs to cut this check for reparations. Um, you know, mental health. Check and clear your conscience, 2020. Mental health counseling, financial literacy. Um, I think I've read, you know, black people, there should be a black minimum wage. Black people shouldn't have to pay taxes. There should be free, reduced education. Um, give us land. Um, there's several different things in different ways that the government can atone primarily with money, with cash money. I want to make sure that's clear. Um, but also for us individuals, like I said, educate yourselves. And once again, this is a census year. Uh, if you have not completed the census, please do that. You can do it online. It literally takes less than 10 minutes. Register to vote and then actually go out and vote. If you're not sure where to go, I'm more than happy. I will post links so that you can have that information. But please vote and let's hold each other accountable. Um, Matt, was there anything else that I guess you wanted to, to share in just terms of like takeaways or action for people? We, we talked about so much. And again, I'm not <laughs> going to tell anybody what to think, but I would encourage you guys to listen to this interview because we did touch on so much. Get a little pencil and pad. And when we, you know, as Latavia just said, when, when we touched on something, go YouTube it, you know, become more informed. Uh, I think uh, my last my last statement, uh, closed out conclusion is, you know, um, we have a lot of people speaking from an uh, uninformed perspective. And although I want to value everybody's input, it is very dangerous to subscribe to uninformed perspectives. Um, it is not that that person's perspective isn't valued, but if we base that perspective solely in feel, feelings and not in facts, then it is going to be a screwed understanding of the current circumstances, which is why I emphasize history so much, because there is literally no way of knowing your future unless you know your past. And the one way that they duped us more than anything else is they made us less and less interested in understanding who we were and more and more interested in who we wanted, who they wanted us to be. So I'm, I'll am leave that jewel right there, everything else. Y'all gonna have to subscribe to her Patreon or send her some cash app tips, cause you know, all the jewels can't be free. 
Yes, yes, yes. So to that point, uh, if you didn't know, like, yes, you, we, oh, goodness, I love, I can't talk. Um, appreciate you all for listening. Um, you can support the podcast through Anchor, Cash App, however, like I said, you can support. But please, if you haven't, um, subscribe and like, uh, leave some comments. Let me know your thoughts. What are some, you know, like I said, we talked about so many things. Matter of fact, one of the things that you mentioned, Matt, that I want to, I think I, I'm personally going to look into in terms of, we talked about the survivors of the Holocaust. They started threatening to sue various corporations. I think that's something that we can do um, in terms of just, you see class actions about everything else, about mesothemiolia and then this and that. And like, I even saw, you know, some people going to be like, were you laid off during the year of 2020? And like, like there's, Last thing I would, t- and I'm sorry, but you brought this to me, especially as a lawyer, look up one of Johnny Cochran's last cases that he was working on. And that's why, you know, that's my guy. Johnny's my guy. But, you know, in certain circles, there's a lot of um, suspicion around our brother and how he left because of the work that he was doing prior to him leaving. But I would seriously, anybody who, this other thing, and I'm sorry because you have the last thing, I promise there had beyond pipe dreams, Dave Chappelle doing his parodies. You know what I'm saying? Like we, we, you know, we're going to have fun. So we joked about reparations and what that would look like. What I would want you guys to know is there's been some serious academia behind reparations. There's been some serious legislation being proposed. There's two uh, bills right now in Congress where they're talking about putting together a commission to even look at it right now. So what I'm saying is this is a serious conversation. And if you want to get educated on it, you go to YouTube, Dr. Claude Anderson is the very first person I would tell you to go stop by. And then from that standpoint, you can venture out to wherever you go. But, you know, if we are to be serious about this, we got to make sure that um, who we are seeking our information from is qualified to speak on the information that we're seeking. So I said that to say is, no offense, I'm not going to ask LeBron what he cares about reparations. I'm not about to go ask Will Smith what he cares about reparations. I'm not about to go, like, I'm like Obama. I'm not about to ask Obama what he cares about reparations. Like, bro, none of the, I'm not about to care. Because when we talk about the collective, the collective is bigger than one perspective. So that's it. The collective is bigger than one man's perspective. There you go. So, yes, it's. Well, you mentioned that I'm just another thing that we can do in terms of reparations is forgive student loan debt. But anyhow, I'm gonna keep saying. And and and, and more than and and more of a phase two aspect of it is as a community we got to forgive ourselves for what we put ourselves through based off of our trauma. And I think that's very very important because we end up being vindictive and resentful towards each other acting out because we didn't recognize that we were in survival. We were on Survivor Island. The fact that we were in uh, the Hunger Games. Um, you know, we don't we don't look at it like that because this has always been our normalcy. You know, we, we all have a cousin that live in public housing. We all have, you know, a brother that it, or a cousin that's locked up right now. Like, so we are all, if not directly affected by what we're talking about, one person removed from somebody who's directly talked about. And we have to be a lot more gentle with ourselves. You know, we, we cannot continuously, it's almost, it's almost, you know, we were talking about this the other day, you know, especially black men, um, but it's a two way street. We can't allow society to beat us up so much that we only feel like we can take that energy out on each other. It can't be like that. We gotta be stronger than that. Um, so beyond all of the other strategic things we need to be doing in regards to negotiating with the dominant society, I would hope more than anything else that um, we definitely be nicer to each other and be nicer to ourselves. You know what I'm saying? Because we didn't know what we knew before we knew it. And, you know, so I don't want anybody to be on like a high horse or anything like, like this. Like, but we all landing together. Ain't nobody ever, you know what I'm saying, been through 2020 before. So we all going through it lockstep together. Um, and yeah, just be nicer to each other, man. We, we've been through a lot, man. We are strong people. We're really, really strong people. And I, we're stronger than what we give ourselves credit for and we're stronger than what they give us credit for. So we have to kind of revert back to that energy and that 
understanding of ourselves and don't let nobody manipulate our energy. You know what I'm saying? If we want to, if, if we want to feel like we want to burn some stuff down or tear it up, it's because we decided we was going to burn it down and we was going to tear it up. Not because somebody else told us to go out and burn it down or somebody else told us to go out there and tear it up. So like more than anything else that I hope we take away from this time and period is, and this the, Ooh, my mouth gonna get me in trouble. But I I gotta say it. I gotta say it. I gotta say it. I'd be remiss if I got off of it and I didn't say it. I I want Trump to win again. I do. I really do. And I was waiting um, to see if that was gonna come out. I do. I tell I said my mouth's gonna get me in trouble. I but I do. And, and and I to be honest to God, the sole reason, the sole reason why I want Trump to win again is because I want to keep this light lit under black people's ass. I really, really do. I don't ever want to jeopardize it. And I know everybody's not going to agree with me, so I'm not going to go with that. But my fear is the fact that we always are looking for somebody outside of ourselves to come save us. That's the constant repetitive conversation that we have. What politician is going to come in, save us from ourselves? And the answer is nobody. There is not one. No, not one. So unless we have our own self-determination, then we're not going to be able to gain any political clout amongst any of the political parties because they know that we lockstep in whatever they tell us to do. So whatever that self-determining thing, you know, Tyreek Nasheed, you know, tangibles 2020, uh, what did he say? The vote ain't free. Like, you know, all, all that, all that. I'm with all that. Uh, I mean, there's some, I mean, there's some bright people out here. There's some bright sisters out here. There's some bright brothers. Like, let's get, Let's organize on that. You know, let's let's do that. I don't know who organizing these marches and these protests, but nah, let's get with these these conventions and these and these workshops and and and, and getting on on that side of it. Because what's gonna end up happening is once we get all of these think tank minds in one room, and we start to value the perspective of this brother and that sister and that sister and this brother, then we come up with a plan that's unstoppable because. We've taken the best from everybody instead of just trying to anoint one person to say, hey, look, let's follow what this person thinks. Like, no, nah, it ain't like that. And that's where, we, historically speaking, we messed up with uh, with W.E.B. To be, uh, w. E. B. Booker and, and Marcus. We messed up with uh, Marcus, you know what I'm saying, uh, uh, with uh, Martin, uh, Malcolm, and, and Elijah, and whoever else you want to throw in there. But constantly, we have these anointed leaders of, of our community whether we anointed them or they were sent over there to us to where um, if they can't conceive or get on the same page, then all of a sudden there's a, a rift that cannot be amended for the greater good, if that makes any sense. So we will sacrifice the greater good for our individual differences. And, and what I'm saying is that can no longer be the case. That can no longer be the case. So we have to, we have to make sure that and your uh, spirit of saying that we keeping each other accountable, that we also have um, a, a collective spirit of unity amongst our train of thought. So that we already come to the table realizing that, you know, we're not the same person. So let's start from there. You your own person, I'm my own person. Let's figure out where our commonality starts and let's only stay there. Let's not, let's not move to the left, let's not move to the right. You know what I'm saying? Let's stay where our commonality is and let's take it from there. I'm laughing because I'm like, you are such a preacher, son. <laughs> last word. Last word. Five more minutes. Five more minutes. <laughs> the third closing. No, but I'm laughing because I have it too. But um, like I said, thank you. <laughs> thank That's you all for listening. Um, so many things, even like I said, that I'm thinking about. Um, as he said, take notes. Listen, take notes. Um, and as we have said a few times, we we are a strong people. We are resilient. Uh, we will find a way to, to laugh, to smile, um, even in the midst of tears. And that uh, it, like I said, it it's it is a it's a part of this process. Like I said, I've given up trying to understand like God's 
it's not for me to understand because your ways are higher than mine or ours and your thoughts are higher than ours. So I know that there is a plan. There is a reason. And at the end, the end, um, you know, like you said earlier, the least of these, we have definitely been the least of these. And um, I, I have no doubt that we will, um, we shall overcome <laughs> and we're going to come out on top in this. And so when we get our reparations, from the American government, it's gonna be all good. So, listen, the first ninety days, black people get their reparations. Oh my God, we giving. Listen, Bob Johnson was talking about fourteen trillion. He, he's talking about fourteen trillion. We gonna spend a good one point seven, like the first ninety days. We are. <laughs> listen, listen, you already know how we are because we serious, but we lit at the same time. So you already know. As soon as they start cashing out those checks. You already know what time it is. It's up everywhere. It's up in Chicago. It's up in Memphis. It's up in, in, in Miami and in L.A. It's up. It's up. And at that point, we no longer have any reason to be jealous and envious of, of our brothers. And that's all That's all, all that, all that, the Willie Lynch theory that was actually made in North Carolina Central University's Black Psychology Department, by the way. Um, you look that one up, too, a uh, little gem right there. But like all this stuff, when, when we get this check, man, like is, it'll be a beautiful day. It'll be the manifestation of Tupac's changes. It'll be it'll be Tupac's changes actually played out in reality, and that'll be a beautiful day. Yes. And on that note, we gonna close out for real, cause Brother King done given us our benediction three times over. Hey, so, let the church say amen. All right. Thank you all. Thank you, Matt. Um, thank you all for listening. Until next time.